ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to Birkbeck this evening for our Holocaust Memorial Day lecture. I'm David Feldman. I'm the director of the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. And uh, this lecture as, um, has almost has been the case almost since, it, since its inception, mm -hmm. is, is shared between the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism and our, uh, our neighbor, the Institute of Historical Research in, in the University of London School for Advanced Studies. And um, after our lecture, there'll be time for questions and discussion, and that part of the evening's proceedings will be moderated by Claire Langhammer, who is the director of the Institute of Historical Research. And it's, 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 it, it, it's both important and a pleasure that we share this event. Could with. you speak up a little? I'm even speaking to the microphone. <laughs> uh, that's always an option. Um, and, and it, it, it's, it's important um, uh, that we share this event with the Institute of Historical Research. It, um, uh, it marks it um, as a particularly significant event in our, in our calendar, and it's always a pleasure working on this event with Claire. It's also a pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Jane Kaplan. I have known Jane for more years than I care to remember. I mean that in a good way, um, um, except in the sense that it, it does date me. But I went to a series of lectures that Jane gave when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge. Because it was Cambridge, only four people turned up to these lectures. <laughs> However, three of them went on to become historians in the University of London. So um, it's probably absolutely appropriate that Jane is here today. And the lecture and the, the lecture series was on the nature of the Nazi state. So what we will be hearing about this evening, in a sense, will be the outcome of a lifetime's research and thought from Jane. Jane has, Jane's publications include Nazi Germany, a very short introduction, and, and also concentration camps in Nazi Germany, uh, the, uh, the New Histories, which she edited with Birkbeck's own Nicholas Waxman. She's also written on the documentation of individual identity, both from the standpoint of the state, but also from the, um, uh, the um, agency, um, uh, from the standpoint of the agency of individuals themselves which led Jane to look into the history of the tattoo, which I know she took so seriously that she had her own small tattoo done to, uh, so that she knew what it was really like. Uh, so um, it's with great anticipation that I introduced Jane and this evening and her lecture What's in a name? The final solution of the Jewish question. I'll start again. What's in a name? From the final solution of the Jewish question to the Holocaust. Okay. Okay. The title of my talk this evening highlights the two most familiar names for the event that we're memorialising: final solution and Holocaust. And my premise is that it's worth devoting some thought to their origins and meaning. Other names have been used, of course, and I'll mention these, or some of them, in the course of my lecture. But I've chosen these two, not only 
only because they are the most widely familiar, but also because I think their meanings and references are not entirely self-evident. Exploring them can help us understand how our knowledge of the event has been shaped and reshaped over time. Because names are my subject, I'm in something of a quandary when it comes to deciding how to refer to the history itself, for fear of foreclosing the very issue that I'm trying to hold open. I've chosen the term, a little awkward, but I've chosen the term the Nazi destruction of the European Jews when I just want to refer to the event itself. And this choice, I think, will become clear in a moment. Now, what is the relation between the terms final solution of the Jewish question and Holocaust? Aren't they just different names for the same event, even if they were adopted at different times? And if their reference are, in fact, different, what exactly is the nature of that difference? One answer can be found in uh, the entry on the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's website, on their um, encyclopedia of the Holocaust, which states firmly that they are not the same. The encyclopedia describes the difference as follows. The Holocaust, this is a quote, the Holocaust was the systematic state-sponsored persecution and murder of Europe's Jews from 1933 to 1945, while the final solution of the Jewish question was the last stage of the Holocaust and took place from 1941 to 1945. It was the deliberate, planned mass murder of Europe's Jews. End of quote. This gets the question going, but I'm not entirely convinced by it, by the answers. I think there's more to understanding what happened than the implied chronological succession and hierarchical relationship between two sets of events, presented either as one coming after another chronologically, or as one that is a categorical subset of the other. But the question to begin with is where do these terms come from in the first place? How and why did they become attached to these events? And whereas the meaning and application of the word Holocaust has attracted a good deal of meaning, sorry, a good deal of commentary, the final solution of the Jewish question is less often anatomized. And that's partly because it tends to be abbreviated to its convenient first half, the final solution. As in writing this book. The Jewish question thereby recedes into unspoken distance, so I'll be paying particular attention to this part of the it's what I want to discuss today, but I want to begin by approaching the subject of this lecture obliquely rather than head on. In commemoration of Holocaust Remembrance Day, one slogan or watchword stands out Never again. Never again demands that we must never forget the Nazis' attempt to exterminate Europe's Jews, nor allow another such genocide or another such genocide or catastrophe to overtake humanity. The emergence and magnetism of the Never Again Pledge in the context of Holocaust memorialization has been explored in recent scholarship, not least by um, the Institute's own um, Diana Popescu. But I'd like to start by bringing to mind something that is suggested by the phrase Never Again, but is less explicitly recognized. This is what I see as its implicit but silent correlate, never before. If never again is an injunction for the future, never before is a description of the challenge that met the first post-war historians as they struggled to find adequate words for a deed that appeared so overwhelming and so unprecedented. This point is not in itself original. There are now whole literatures on the historical, <coughs> the historical antecedents and parallels to the Nazi destruction of the European Jews on the necessity or impossibility of comparison, and on the challenge of representation on the grand scale. What I want to discuss today, though, is something more modest and a good deal, or at least as important, I should say, more modest but just as important. A name was needed for the deed in 1945, but what should that name be? Let me describe this challenge in the words of the now celebrated historian of the period, Raoul Hilberg, who began his research into the destruction of the Jews in the silence of the late 1940s. Looking back after six decades, Hilberg reflected on this problem more than once. Um, this is a composite quote from several um, talks he gave on the subject. At the very beginning, references to the Holocaust were clouded, 
the phenomenon had no name. There was as yet no word for what had happened. The vocabulary with which to describe what had happened had not yet been developed. The entire process had not yet been grasped. End of quote. Hilberg felt himself confronted by an almost impossible task of historical reconstruction, which encompassed a deed so massive in scope and so unprecedented in character that even its perpetrators found it hard to move. As the scale and enormity of the deed acquired definition after 1945, it seemed to deny historians any conceivable vocabulary or narrative strategy. And no language meant no history, or at least a fragmented history of mass murder, of massacres, of persecution and atrocity, told mostly through the post-war tribunals, you know, the and so on, and survivor memoirs, memoirs. Even when a tentative lexicon began to surface, Hilberg rejected much of it because he refused on principle to use any words with abhorrent or obfuscatory metaphorical relevances. This ruled out, for example, the term extermination, which was often used, with its association of the victims with vermin, or words like murder or execution with their judicial overtones. <coughs> for this reason, when Hilbert finally found a publisher for his monumental study in 1961, the title he gave it was The Destruction of the European Jews, term I've taken over from him, using a blunt but neutral term that carried no obvious pejorative association. Hilberg's language embodied a deliberate choice of perspective as well. His subject was explicitly not the experience and suffering of the Jews under the Nazi onslaught, but the decision, the policies, procedures and actions of the bureaucrats in the civil service, the business sector, the Nazi movement and the military hierarchy who perpetrated their destruction. Hilberg made this clear, unequivocally clear and almost provocatively so. Quote, this is not a book about Jews. It is a book about the people who destroyed the Jews. In other words, it was not a book of Jewish history, but a book about what Hilberg called Western history. So it's several removes in some ways from the event itself. Hilberg's distinction between the history of the Jews and, the, and Western history was intended to legitimate his research among otherwise sceptical academics. His dissertation advisors had warned him that the annihilation of Europe's Jews was not in itself a fit or meaningful subject of academic study. He therefore had to redeem it from its marginal status as a subject without proper scholarly credentials. And he also wanted to emphasize the objective neutrality of the scholar of his scholarship rather than the subjective perspectives of those involved. Only an approach that, in his words, could, quote, serve as a test of existing conceptions about force, about relations between cultures, about society as a whole. I mean, a huge canvas if you want to legitimate your work in a wider field, you couldn't have chosen anything much more than that. Um, so only a, 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 a book that put things in this context could pass muster. What took centre stage in his expanded model was therefore the vast organisation, this is a quote from him, the vast organisation of the Nazi machinery of destruction and the men who performed important functions in this machine. When Hilberg comes to write about the gas chambers, in consequence, he describes their installation and their use in unembellished factual terms. There are no descriptions of SS men barking orders or terrified Jews awaiting their fate. Now, Hilberg's manuscript languished unpublished for almost a decade after he had completed it. It was published in 1961, but it was not translated into German until 1982. I mean, from the perspective of the present, this seems almost unbelievable. But this is the situation at that time. As a result, Hilberg's research was beaten to publication by another pioneering study, and that's the one that is um, highlighted there. Um, this one by Gerald Reitling, a, a British scholar, although not an academic. His book, The Final Solution, The Attempt to Exterminate the Jews of Europe, appeared in Britain in 1953 and in Germany in 1956. So it, it's in some senses, I mean, one can use this term, a more popular book, even though it is a scholarly book that has stood the test of time. 
Right Lino was evidently ne less troubled by Hilberg's scruples about language, as you can see from the title, and he was forthright about what was meant by the final solution of the Jewish problem. He said, and I quote, it was a code name for Hitler's plans to exterminate the Jews in Europe, used by German officials after the summer of 1941, in order to avoid the necessity of admitting, even among themselves, that such plans existed. Or, one might say, that they were already being carried out. Okay, now let's look more closely at that alleged code name, the final solution of the Jewish problem. Towards the end of September 1939, the um, SS um, SD leader in charge of Jewish matters, Reinhard Heydrich, had made a distinction in a memo between the secret final dome, NCO, of Nazi anti-Jewish policy in now conquered Poland, and the intermediate short-term, or Kurzmissig, stages towards this goal. For those in the know at this time, we're talking September 1939, so very early in the occupation of Poland. For those in the know, the final goal at this time was the mass deportation of German and Polish Jews into reservations by methods that would inevitably and intentionally result in mass death from starvation and privation. Variants of, these, of this description surface in later, in later documents. And in December, 9, December 1939, so just a few months later, the um, SS Jewish desk prepared an extensive memo <coughs> entitled The Endlösung des Deutschen Judenkommens. So, the final solution of the German <coughs> Jewish problem. A memo from Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, who was given huge areas of responsibility in the solution of the Jewish question. A memo by Eichmann from December 1940, entitled Die Judenfrage, the Jewish question, contrasted the initial solution, and Anfangslösung, of the Jewish question by emigration, with the endlösung der Judenfrage, the final solution of the Jewish question, by means of mass deportation and resettlement. Kinsinkly is the German word. By the end of July 1941, after many vicissitudes in concept and plan, the invasion of the Soviet Union seemed finally to open a clear path to a murderous final solution on a European scale. Uh, Goering, using authority given to him in 1938 by Hitler, charged Heidrich with the task of, quote, carrying out all necessary preparations with regard to organizational, practical, and material matters for bringing about a comprehensive solution and gesamtlösung of the Jewish question in the German sphere of influence in Europe. I further charge you to send me in due course a comprehensive plan, gesamt and Wurf, concerning the organizational, practical, and material measures necessary for the accomplishment of the desired final solution of the Jewish question, and those of the and that document, when I just quoted, is the one that is um, often taken as, the, as putting the seal of, of, of enactment on the policy that had been decided. How that policy was decided is a matter of ongoing debate among historians. For a long time, people were looking for a clear Hitler decision, and eventually it became clear that that was um, not going to be discovered. Anyway, that's no, that is another lecture. But you see, there's a build up of the language of final solution here. But how and why did this phrase, final solution of the Jewish question, come to be available to these SS bureaucrats? Was it a term they had coined for bureaucratic convenience? Or if it wasn't, where did it come from? And is it best understood as a euphemism for something unspecified and unspeakable? Or is its status a little less clear than that? Although it's now commonly abbreviated as enders of the final solution, the full phrase combined two elements, as I've already said, final solution and the Jewish question. The more familiar final solution is a shorthand for the programme that by 1949, sorry, by 1941, was to embrace the mass destruction of Europe's Jewish population. But what about the rest of it, the Judenfrage, the Jewish question, the Jewish problem? This word was in no way a Nazi coinage, and it is worth taking a look into its history. So, some remarks on the Jewish question. The proposition that there was a Jewish question was a product of the emancipation of Jews in Europe 
in the broad transition from a post-feudal to a bourgeois political and social order, in which all male citizens were treated equally before the law, irrespective of religion or race. As articulated for the late 18th century, the Jewish question can be reduced to this. How could anyone simultaneously be fully a citizen while also remaining fully a Jew? Could a Jew be a regular member of civil society? Or did he belong to an extraneous community, one that retained a constitutive sense of collective identity and difference? To put it the other way around, did the price of Jewish emancipation and citizenship have to be the renunciation of the diaspora's historic ethno-religious identity. This was a conundrum that was debated throughout Europe, but it was given extra salience in 19th century Germany. As emancipation took off in the 1830s and 1840s, definitions of the Jewish question and of proposals for its solution were canvassed in a lively pamphlet literature authored by Jews and non-Jews alike. What gave it an extra edge in Germany was the fact that what Germany was and who was a German were not fully resolved, certainly not until unification in 1871 and not even after that. So Germany is in question at the same time that Jews are in question. In fact, that Dublin Council <coughs> actually explored in all kinds of interesting um, studies on, on problems. As a result, the Jewish question became part of a larger German question where it remained a matter of contention at a deep political, ideological, and also emotional level. The open controversy on these matters subsided a bit in the mid 19th century. You can see clearly, even if you haven't read them, you can look at the, at, at the publication, list of publications, it's clear. A peak from the 1830s and 1840s, and then a trough again, and then it peaks, it seems like control from the 1890s to the so the open controversy subsided in the mid-century, but it never entirely vanished, and it surfaced again with a vengeance in the 1880s and 1890s. By the 1880s, the question had mutated, and so had the character and tone of anti-Semitism. That term, by the way, was coined by the NTC Mike Ilhan Marr in 1879 or so. Whereas the German Jewish question was first articulated as the challenge of Jewish emancipation, and civic integration in the new post ständisch order, order, its resurgence in the 1880s was powered by the ceremonial unification of Germany in 1871 and the shock of the long economic depression after 1873. Jews as a group were alleged to have reaped huge economic and cultural benefits from their new opportunities to the detriment of non Jewish Germans. <coughs> in the hands of increasingly organised anti Semites, the argument was reimagined in increasingly violent terms, pillorying Jewish Germans as the perpetrators of a strategic <coughs> campaign of racial domination that was poisoning the lifeblood of the German people. Logically, the existence of this Jewish question implied the need for an answer, the more so since the Jews were conflated in anti Semitic discourse with the systemic crisis of modernity itself, which is becoming very in other languages and other languages. Thus, the existence of a menacing Jewish question that demanded radical strategies for its solution was widely trumpeted in 19th century Germany. By then, the argument was no longer about the terms of Jewish emancipation, but about its allegedly inevitable and intolerable results. Emancipation had been intended to remove Judaism as a formal impediment to full citizenship. But, according to the anti Semites, this strategy had allegedly failed. Jews were still Jews, they were on the march to destroy Germany, and the question for anti Semites was how emancipation could be reversed, how Germany could resolve its Jewish question once and for all. Anti Semitic ideology had gathered fresh momentum from the penetration of a new ideological concept of race into political discourse. This embodied the idea that a people was an organic racial community that was vulnerable to physical menaces from external forces. A language of infection and parasites was emerging on the further reaches of anti-Semitic polemics. With this, Jews can be represented not just as a, cultural, um, as a culturally alien group who could never be fully German, but as a physical threat that must be eliminated. The late 19th century pamphlet literature 
It is therefore replete with calls and proposals for the solution of the Jewish question. For quote, I'm going to quote from a number of these here. For quote, a complete and lasting solution, follow or down the version of the Jewish question. For a fundamental and final solution, currently here on integrating the version. I'm quoting here from an 1897 text by a complicated figure, um, Karl Friedrich Hermann, Heyman, a pastor in the Evangelical Church, whose father was a convert from Judaism and also a pastor. Heyman was a fan of all the usual anti-Semitic stereotypes. At the same time, he collaborated with the Zionist pioneer Theodor Herzl and helped him to organize the first World Zionist Congress in 1897. Like others, Heyman insisted that, quote, the Jewish question can be solved by no one other than the Jews themselves which deliberately implies that they are responsible for their status as a problem. We find a seed throughout, throughout this, this uh, literature. Heyman called on Jews to recognize that only Zionism could deliver a thoroughgoing, coinflation of solution of the Jewish question. Zionism offered a geopolitical solution to the question of emancipation that failed to solve in the realm of culture, identity, and the nation state. Thus, Herzl's own groundbreaking publication of 1896, Der Judenstadt, was subtitled Versuch einer modernen Lösung der Judenfrage, Considerations for a Modern Solution to the Jewish Question. Zionism promised to remove the Jewish question by removing the Jews. Now, removal was supposedly the antonym of assimilation, and was a common trope among both anti Semites and Zionists. But I think it's an empty or at least an elastic term that was available to be filled with a range of possible meanings, from removal of difference by assimilation to a vague invocation of removal by emigration or expulsion, or potentially something more severe. In my reading for this lecture, I was struck by a characteristic rhetorical mood in this anti-Semitic literature, in which an author conjured the possibility that removal might mean physical destruction, only to dismiss it. In 1933, for example, the theologian Gerhard Kittler listed four possible answers to the Jewish question, starting with Ausrotten, a word that is usually translated as extermination or eradication. Kittler immediately dismissed this as not a serious proposition. And you can find examples in other, in other writings. So he dismisses it, he covers it up and then dismisses it. But I mean, this is a move which in rhetoric is called apophasis, pretending to deny what is actually affirmed. And I think you can say that this kind of propaganda is replete with that kind of rhetorical move. Similarly, Heyman, who I, I cited a moment ago, the, um, the man who was um, uh, the collaborator of Herzl, put it like this somewhat earlier. The Jews are our misfortune. We have called this into the forests of the people. Is it any surprise that the people's voice echoes back in response? Strike the Jews dead and our misfortune will be as well. If you don't want to hear such true answers, you ought not to pose the question in terms that rationally allow only this answer. Let me pursue that last point just for a moment. A few years ago, the American historian Holly Case proposed in an ingenious book that 19th century Europe should be labelled the age of questions. By this she meant that prominent political issues of the day were formulated as questions. That was the characteristic way of defining them. These questions could be aired in the newly emancipated public sphere of open conversation. <coughs> you can probably think easily enough of other examples of questions. The Irish question, the Eastern question, the woman question. Um, and the German question, of course, and it's 19th century and it's Cold War incarnation. Um, I heard a reference to the Palestine question in a, a TV debate. The, the Jewish question was not the first such question to be articulated, but it was arguably one of the most durable and international. And of course, it has become identified as <coughs> its eventually lethal solution <coughs> to a unique extent. But in all cases, to present an issue as a question, this is. Um, Sorry, in cases argument, was to create the necessity of a solution and to anticipate the most radical possible option. And this was not all. 
In the words, and I've taken this summary from one of the reviews of Holly Case's book because it, it captures it um, more succinctly than a lot of the nation words. So the reviewer wrote, the great questions of the 19th century were not genuine inquiries, they were rep weapons. To reframe a complex issue as a question was a powerful way to define the terms of the debate, foreclose alternatives, and advance a preferred course of action. So it's a stitch up moment. Posing a question was a strategy to novel the terms of debate in advance and presuppose the urgency of a final resolution. In its most extreme form, the strategy carried the promise that resolving the question of issue would be the key to resolving the ills of modernity itself. I mean, clearly that summary doesn't do justice to Case's argument. It, her book has been pretty controversial, but I find it incredibly useful to think of it. Um, and um, if, it's, if it's a little awkward, um, also presses to the base um, to itself to make relevant conclusions. Those are forgivable, I think. This brief history of the Jewish question and its solution or final solution opens a somewhat neglected perspective on the discursive treatment of the final solution of the Jewish question in Nazi Germany. I have come to think that it is not so much that the final solution was employed in Nazi policy circles as a deliberate euphemism, although I confess I've called this myself. I've undergone a kind of process of reconsideration in reading more of this um, um, 19th century Nazi literature. Um, so I've used the term euphemism myself. But it's not the case either that the Nazis added the Nazi final to an existing term. In fact, the alleged need for a final or lasting solution of the Jewish question had been openly canvassed for several decades and in increasingly violent terms. And I've tried to give some examples of the disguised ways in which it was introduced into 19th century anti Semitic discourse. By the 1930s, the idea was already, so to speak, domesticated. It was a commonplace of Nazi anti Semitic propaganda where it was combined with the most violent and threatening language calling the Jews be treated as infectious bacilli. I mean, the stuff begins to proliferate after 1933. And, well, obviously, most of it is If Nazi usage filled the word with the most radical meaning possible, I think it may be not so much that it was being treated as a euphemism, but more that the word could be exploited as a kind of lexical alibi, a palimpsest of layered meanings drawing on decades of polemics and threats that were now being turned to action. So I think the, the sort of linguistic and um, uh, sort of conceptual um, use of final solution carries, I think, something that people understood almost as much as they didn't. If you see what I mean. It was, a, it was a, 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 an area in which there were many possibilities to fish. Okay, I'll turn now to the final solution of the Jewish question. As a name for the destruction of the European Jews, the final solution of the Jewish question thus any remaining restraints on its meaning when it was absorbed into the post-war West German and Anglo-European academic and journalistic lexicon. It's not clear what it meant, or at least it was if it's clear. Because it was the intentional language of ideology of Nazi ideologues, bureaucrats, and murderers, however, it's usually been demarcated by scare quotes. Writing them doesn't have scare quotes. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yes, yeah. okay, that's fine. Writing it doesn't... Um, uh, Pope Scarecrow is his, his, um, his title, but if you look in the text, it's almost always um, demarcated, something that um, is, is uh, not quite um, permissible, so to speak. To study the final solution after the war was to step into the world of Nazi leaders' decisions, their orders and their bureaucracies. You're putting yourself, your historical stance, in the foot of the perpetrator. This was the perspective taken up by research into the Nazi destruction of the European Jews that finally took off on an international scale in the 1970s. This perspective sponsored historians' quest to answer precise questions about the process by which the final solution emerged as policy. When was the decision to annihilate the Jews reached? Precisely when and how did the final solution come to bear its eventual certainty of wholesale physical extermination, as opposed to denoting some lesser project of isolation or removal. Was this the result of a Hitler order of some kind, or was it the product of some more diffuse path of convergent decisions and acts? Irrespective of the question, this was, so to speak, perpetrator history on the grand scale, 
And in this sense, this early research in the 1970s followed in the footsteps of pioneers like Reichland and Hilberg. Other perspectives than those of the Nazi uh, officials and bureaucrats and the structures within which they worked were not entirely ignored, but they were sidelined. In an uncanny echo of the marginalization of the history as such immediately after the war, so the history of the mass murder of the Jews, the annihilation of the Jews, is not regarded as a serious subject of study immediately after the war. And then when it does become a serious subject of study, most of the earlier work focuses, I and mean, this is not exclusively true, but it tends to focus on the apparatus of decision making and policy enactment and so on, and the subjective experiences of the Jews who were the objects and victims of these policies, that is sidelined as, um, as, 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 not, as not serious. What explanatory light after all could the victims cast on the process of that movement? In the final solution of the Jewish question, the Jews were all too obviously, in this way of thinking, invisible, except as body counts and as the objects of Nazi decisions and acts. <coughs> the eventual emergence of the victims into greater prominence was one of the conditions for the displacement of final solution by Holocaust. That's what makes them quite difficult. And it was largely the product of multiple changes in academic and popular culture which gathered momentum from the late 1970s. I mean, this is a, a pool into which you can throw a stone and look off the goat as far as you want to. I mean, there are always changes going on in the wider culture of, of academic and popular history. And um, I, you, know, you, you, you summarize them at your peril, but you want to, I, you know, one has to try to focus on the, on the changes that are most important for the issues in question. <coughs> to summarize radically, Historians and their readerships were no longer satisfied with focusing on the politics and policies of major actors, nor evaluating them in solely institutional terms. That was the context in which I was trained. I was trained as someone who worked on the history of the German civil service, the German bureaucracy, and it was a purely institutional history. But after, um, through the 1970s and 1980s, we began to consider the experiences of those living beyond the traditional circuits of power, the people who were conventionally represented as the objects rather than the subjects of history. We were also increasingly interested in looking more widely at subjective experience, how people understood themselves and grasped their situations in terms of their complex <coughs> beliefs and motives, rather than simply as the targets of ideology and propaganda. And you can watch, I mean, you could do a kind of a chart showing the the gradual eclipse and vanishing, not vanishing, but the eclipse of the term propaganda as an explanatory term for, for how people allowed themselves to be made into Nazis or, or, or collaborated with the regime in various ways. More complicated than being told what to do. In terms of my subject today, this perspective not only foregrounded the experience of the victims, when I put victims in scarecrows and in my paper in order to show that it's a, that, 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 that a monster mark the term and not make it something really. It foregrounded the experience of the victims as, a, as an essential part of the story. And it also suggested that the passive status of the victim was not the only <coughs> of character. There is no neat chronology to this uneven process of the expansion and substitution of historical horizons. But I think that its, its essential meaning can be encapsulated in one striking example. In her well-known book, The War Against the Jews, 1933 to 1945, published in 1975, the American historian Lucy Davidovitz divided her text into two parts. Who's come across Davidovitz's book? Okay, a fair number of people. I mean, it was the book of the mid-70s. It was the most, it was one of the, well, such a terrible book. But um, it was one that was very, very widely known, especially in America, where it was um, first published. Anyway, Davidovitz divided her text into two parts the final solution and the Holocaust. But this division did not, as you might think, reflect the Holocaust Museum's chronology that I quoted at the beginning of this lecture. Now, how many people remember that? <laughs> I can repeat it actually. It was um, 
that the United States, the Holocaust Museum's distinction is between the Holocaust as the whole period between 1933 and 45, and the final solution as just simply the period of mass extermination from 1941 to 1945. So Davidovitz divides her text into the final solution from the Holocaust, but not according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's um, matrix. Both parts of her book cover the entire history from 1933 to 1945. <coughs> her division was thematic, and her language declared this. Part one, the final solution, attempted to answer the question of, quote, how it was possible for a modern state to carry out the systematic murder of the whole people for no other reason than that they were Jewish, end quote. By contrast, part two, the Holocaust, described the Jewish response to the final solution. So this is a very, very different way of looking at it. And, the, and the, um, in, in some senses, um, that distinction um, is one that, that really underlines, or as I said, epitomizes the transition that I've been trying to um, describe and explain today. But anyway, I can't think of a more succinct way to illustrate that difference. Okay, now the last part of, of my lecture, I'm going to speed up, I see time is not um, I'd now like to turn to the second part of my title, the Holocaust. Holocaust is a Greek word that entered English and other languages through the Septuagint as the Greek translation of the Hebrew korban Ola, a burnt offering. In the course of the centuries, the word lost its exclusively religious meaning and was also applied to secular disasters or tragedies, as well as to massacres of both uh, Jews and non-Jews. So we can speak of a Holocaust, specifically meaning in Jewish. A, a mass destruction. I think it was still in this sense that Viscount Samuel referred to a Holocaust from which Jews were trying to escape in a speech he gave in a Lord's debate on German atrocities and aid for refugees in March 1943. So you can find it in the Hansard record of the debate, but I don't think he's talking about what I'm about to talk about now, which is that Holocaust becomes the Holocaust. Other words used in this debate and elsewhere have similarly generic meanings, such as disaster, catastrophe, extermination, or in German, Vernichtung, Auswaltung. Among Jewish historians who were virtually alone in their concern for the subject in the 40s and 50s, designations included the Hebrew Korban, also adopted into Yiddish, a good deal of the early literature was written in Yiddish, um, and another term um, which uh, Jewish historians use is Shoah. And these words signify respectively destruction and disaster or tragedy. The vocabulary carried a religious or sacred meaning at this time and pointed intentionally to a history of suffering unique to the Jewish people. By the early 1950s, Shoah had acquired a capital S and an article, the Shoah. And I think most people here have recognized that term as a contemporary term for a description. It acquired also canonical status in official Israeli discourse, initially through the publication of Yad Vashem. Holocaust then became more familiar internationally through the reportage on the Eichmann trial in 1961. Um, I've never known if this is um, true or not, but allegedly um, it emerged into the reports of the trial as a result of a mistranslation of Shoah by English speaking journalists. They translated Shoah, which was being used in the um, in the uh, Italian portrait. And we just translated it um, as Holocaust. <coughs> as this literature expanded, oh sorry, the, the publicity given to the trial, to the outcome trial, prompted a new wave of public interest in the history of Nazism and the destruction of the European Jews, to which journalistic and popular publications responded. So it looks like, um, eventually like the Lewis. As this literature expanded through the 70s and 80s, so Holocaust too, was vested with the additional authority of a capital letter and an article, the Holocaust, and was explained, obtained for exclusive reference to the Holocaust. I don't think you can easily use the term Holocaust today without it conjuring up the Holocaust, which is a matter of huge contention when, of course, um, people wish to speak of the Holocaust of, of, of Roma and Sinti, of the Holocaust of Russian prisons of war, or something like that, and other acts of, 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 of mass murder. The word itself was rapidly absorbed into the English-speaking world, most notably in the USA, and less quickly absorbed into Germany. 
In the United States, the President's Commission on the Holocaust was convened by Jimmy Carter in 1978 to develop plans for the establishment and maintenance of an appropriate memorial to those who perished in the Holocaust. That's um, the last part of this quotation from, from Carter's declaration. It was chaired, his commission was chaired by a survivor, Amy Wiesel, and indicatively, the membership of the commission was composed almost entirely of faith leaders, not historians. Many three historians among them. A long list of people. In Germany, by contrast, final solution remained the standard, um, and not just an academic publication. When the TV film, sorry, when, when Holocaust, the word Holocaust, appeared in the titles of foreign books, the German translation was likely to substitute or add the more familiar term endlosen, because Holocaust was not recognized in Germany as easily in Germany. And endlosen was. Okay, so though they need for some additional explanation of the title. Similarly, when the US TV series Holocaust was broadcast in Germany in 1979, press coverage felt it necessary to explain the title. It was not, uh, not so familiar in Germany. The TV series is usually credited as another major turning point in the growth of public interest in the history of what was now being widely known as the Holocaust both in Europe and the USA. This popular groundswell paralleled the growing sub audibility of survivor voices, as well as the expansion of academic research. So there's a proliferation of different kinds of research under the authority of the term Holocaust. In West Germany, um, a lot of scholarly authors, there were some notable cases where scholarly controversies erupted into the public sphere, giving um, more publicity to the term in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, as a new generation sought to come to terms with their country's past. In Germany and elsewhere, national campaigns for memorialization uh, proliferated, and pressure for international recognition um, also intensified. The year 2000 saw the UN Declaration on, Hol on Holocaust Remembrance, and in 2005 came the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which we are observing with this lecture. It's clear that the word Holocaust now commands international recognition. Although in deference to Israeli usage, the UN Declaration, which I've just mentioned, simultaneously refers to it as the Shoah. The position gained by Holocaust was not attained without some argument. In the 1980s, I was among of many historians who felt unease about the religious resonance, the overturns of the term Holocaust, and we preferred not to use it. It was sort of Declaration of Principle, because this is not how we wanted to understand this history. We felt that it risked identifying the event as uniquely unique, to a certain level beyond understanding, and almost literally withdrawn from the tools of secular history. This is one implication of what I began with, the never before, never again pair. This is, makes it into an event unique in its singularity, not to have happened before what we didn't know what it was, not to happen again in the day of tomorrow. But no matter how horrifying and unprecedented the deed is, historians are bound to believe that it is in principle subjected, to, it is a principle subject to the tools of rational historical explanation. And that these will not diminish its enormity. For this reason, some historians continue to research, to, sorry, to resist the term um, Holocaust. And a notable example of this is the late David Cesarani who was the United Kingdom's leading historian of the events before his untimely death in 2015. His final book, published posthumously under the title of Final Solution, The Fate of the Jews, mounts a resolute critique of the word Holocaust. He saw the term not as a simple descriptor of a set of events, but as a cultural construction, a misleading one of that. He felt it no longer accorded, the idea of the Holocaust as a unitary event, no longer accorded with the way that research had shown the, the, the unevenness, the complexity, the multiplicity, the different layers, the different locations, the different perpetrators of this um, set of deeds that we call the Holocaust for the final solution. The image popularly represented by Auschwitz, whose liberation on January the 27th is named in 2005 as Holocaust. The image represented by 
Auschwitz no longer accords with the realities revealed by research since the 1990s, a reality of multiple decision-making processes, multinational perpetrators, different methods of national labor, and diverse experiences. Cesarani confines his book to the fate of the Jews, who he argues were uniquely positioned in Hitler's vision of Nazi ideology as, quote, an implacable, powerful, global enemy that had to be fought at every turn and finally eliminated. Whether the Holocaust comprehended other victim groups um, is a little less contentious now than it was when those groups were first making their claim. But it's still an, it's still an awkward assumption. Um, the UK Holocaust Memorial Day Trust makes a delicate but significant distinction when it declares that its mission is, quote, you have to listen carefully, to remember six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust alongside the millions of people murdered under Nazi persecution of other groups, and during the more recent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. So the Holocaust is still given um, a particular meaning within this, and it is not under the uh, terms of the UK's, um, if you like, official cultural position, and it does not extend to other groups. Okay. In conclusion, when I finished my reading of this lecture, I was left with the conclusion that it's not that one term is right and the other wrong, but more that we should simply be aware that both have their problems. As far as final solution is concerned, there is obviously something distasteful about using language contaminated with its Nazi heritage as a historical marker. And even fencing it round the scare groups doesn't seem quite sanitizing enough. And in the case of Holocaust, I find myself in dispute with the distinction offered by the, the Holocaust Museum Encyclopedia, which I've quoted um, or referred to several times, that Holocaust should denote the entire 1933 to 1945 period and final solution to final cataclysm of mass murder. We can talk about that more. But I believe the word, word Holocaust has to refer to the enormity of the family of The victims claim the rights of naming Holocaust, Nakhai, Holomir, should obviously be honoured. I think we have to have room with that somewhere. But for this reason, I agree with David Cesarani that even if the religious overtones of Holocaust are no longer so loud, the term needs to be understood more as a cultural construction than as a historical event. Still, to look for total transparency in language is a fool's errand. Instability and indeterminacy, indeterminacy are inherent in language, any language. Our efforts of precision often fail, yet perhaps often do so productively. The least we can do is make ourselves aware of where language comes from. <coughs> what context it migrates in and out of, and what unregistered baggage it carries. And I think that, this, that in all our efforts at narrative and explanation, language will always have a last word. Thank you.